So this is a talk about uh, making music with Ruby and uh, sort of yeah, a little bit of sound space. Um, I'm Noah, uh, and I make music, and I also make software. Um, I'm also the organizer of the Bay Area Computer Music Technology Group. Um, we've had uh, 30 events uh, since our creation in 2007. We've gathered at various places, Stanford Mills, Berkeley, Dolby Expression, Digital Design. Is that any better? No. I know, it's a little more rock and roll. It's better that way. Thank you. All right. Hmm, no boom. <laughs> I'm just going to stand like this. <laughs> All right. Okay, so uh, we've had, uh, is this better? Okay, very good. All right. So um, yes, SparkMutt, the Bay Area Computer Music Technology Group, uh, strange acronym. 30 events, uh, lots of gatherings, great presenters. Um, John Chowning, the inventor of FM Synthesis presented. Uh, Go Wong, the creator of the Chuck programming language. Tim Thompson, the creator of KeyKit. Um, Jerome Lanier, a number of other great people have presented. Um, and there's an event tonight at Pier 38 um, at Embarcadero in Townsend. And if you want to come by, you're certainly welcome. Um, so I'm also uh, building an uh, um, online music instruction platform uh, called Ashbury Music Hall. Um, and uh, worked with a dance troupe called uh, Capacitor. Um, we recently did a uh, urban canopy project, which is a collaboration with the California Academy of Sciences. And uh, we ended up at TED 2009 with that project. Um, and I have a band, uh, which is called uh, Rabbit's Rum. And I wanted to play a little bit of music before we start diving into the code because, um, it, I don't know, somehow it puts your head in the right space. <laughs> so this is a, a track of mine. Cool, my wife is checking on me. Uh, yes. All right, so. oh, did something cool. <laughs> so uh, that can be the experience of uh, <laughs> writing, writing music with software. And the point of this talk is to kind of get over that, <clears throat> that stage and actually be able to do some cool stuff with Ruby. Um, so back to the topic, making music with Ruby. Um, and this is going to be an overview of available libraries and strategies for working with them. Um, and really the point is to maximize your fun because um, you have a limited amount of time for uh, working on fun projects and uh, so you should, you should maximize that time. So um, here's a small fun interruption before we get started, which is that Ruby is not the fastest language and um, we're talking about doing audio processing and things like that. So it's good to think about um, four different um, rates of time um, in music systems. And they all have kind of different demands. So the first one is non-real time. So this would be like, you know, I'm rendering a file and I don't care when it gets done or, you know, those sorts of things. And there's soft real time, which is your exact timing isn't really important. You're 
they're triggering something and it doesn't matter if there's like a, it, it's gonna happen at a specific moment. And then there's control rate, which is, uh, you know, th for things like um, MIDI or open sound control, which is another um, MIDI, uh, another uh, uh, music control language. Um, and those, uh, those kinds of events have to occur within like a 10 millisecond range for you to um, be comfortable with the timing of them. Um, and then there's audio rate, which is you know, 44,100 times per second and multiple things happening at the same time. So Ruby is not so great at the third category of audio rate, um, but um, it's decent at doing control rate stuff, soft real time or non real time uh, tasks. Um, and uh, you can also rely on other schedulers, um, say like Ableton Live or Chuck or the Super Collider. Um, programming language, Java, C libraries. Um, and uh, you also can interface with faster audio rate libraries for doing um, digital signal processing. So <coughs> why use Ruby? Basically because it's a great, highly usable language. And um, it's good for writing uh, domain specific languages um, for declarative uh, type work. Um, it's really good for gluing systems together and if you're doing multimedia stuff, sometimes you have a whole array of things that that need to be glued together, like uh, I need to get some Twitter information and plug it into this, you know, sound installation or something like that. Um, and then there's um, there's also rich libraries in Ruby um, that are lacking in audio programming languages. Um, so who might want to use Ruby for audio? And uh, I thought about it, and there's three main types of uh, users that I kind of want to address in the talk. The first one is Carl the composer. So Carl's uh, needs are that uh, he wants to compose music. He doesn't really care when it gets written, more soft real-time concern, um, maybe outputting MIDI, maybe out outputting an uh, audio file, WAV file. And uh, his favorite drink is oolong, perhaps <coughs> Earl Grey, something like that. Um, so our second user, um, potential user, is Henry Hacker. And this is like someone who wants to make command line music or like interface their, their create some sort of communication between some obscure uh, piece of data and music or write command line music or live coding or those sorts of things. Um, and this kind of user, I say soft real time here, but uh, when I think about it, actually hard real time would be great as well. Uh, favorite drink, probably cold pressed coffee. Um, and third user is DJ Diana, who um, is all about live uh, performance. Um, so everything has to be very precise timing, um, real-time control rate, favorite drink, Red Bull. Um, there's a third uh, user profile that's not in here, which is uh, Danny DSP, and uh, uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that um, in this talk. Um, so Snorkel. Snorkel is a library that I put together for exploring um, Ruby uh, programming. It's uh, pushed up to GitHub um, at uh, github.com slash aquabu slash snorkel. Um, and basically I pulled together a whole bunch of libraries. Um, a lot of them, some of them you may have heard of before. Some of them are a little bit more obscure. And uh, I, have, uh, I have examples for most of them and they're also the examples for this talk. So it's a good starting point. Um, and uh, definitely send me your feedback, um, particularly about installation. There needs to be an installation script um, because there's a lot of uh, sort of strange dependencies and things. So first, um, first user that we're going to talk about is uh, Carl the Composer. So Carl wants to make music, particularly algorithmic music. And uh, what should we generate music from? How about Pi? So <laughs> um, everyone, when they start making generative music, tends to write some kind of program that uh, takes an irrational number and converts it into music. And so I think that that's a good starting point and I can save you a little time in, uh, in doing this so your, set your first project can be something else. Um, but um, there's also some interesting things that you can do with sort of quasi-random streams of numbers and quantizing them, et cetera. So for this uh, particular project, we're gonna use Ruby, Chuck, and <coughs> Pi. So what is Chuck? So Chuck is a real-time audio language. Um, it was created by uh, Gu Wang and Perry Cook at Princeton. Um, its focus is programmer productivity and live coding, and the fourth bullet point that's not really here is that it's not exceptionally mature, but it's very usable. Um, and so it's, uh, 
it's very quick to get things started, and at a certain point, you're kind of like, boy, I really wish this was in the language. And when you get to that point, um, you either you know write it or find some way around it, or you um, or you switch to Super Collider. So, um, but uh, Chuck is a really great programming language for getting uh, projects started, and it has some some cool properties. So uh, Chuck installation, um, you can grab it from its location uh, at Princeton to download. And I should make note that um, the two operators that you see here on the left is the Chuck operator, uh, which chucks things, and then the second operator is the upchuck operator. <laughs> so <coughs> Chuck in four slides. So say you want to make a sound. Um, Line one is you're creating a sine wave oscillator, and um, it is assigned to the variable s, and then it is chucked to the digital audio converter. And um, so nothing would happen if you just wrote this line because time is standing still. You have to explicitly advance time in chuck, um, which is one of the interesting properties of the language, is that time is actually a data type. Um, so, uh, so the second line is, um, chuck one second to now, which means that basically I'm going to play the sine wave oscillator until one second has elapsed. Um, so the, it's basically saying, I'm not going to do anything with, with the scheduler until um, this, am this amount of time advances. Um, so second slide um, builds on the first one. So you've got the sine wave. How do you change the pitch? Um, so here, um, line four, you have uh, the number 880, and you are chucking it to your um, sine wave uh, frequency. Um, and then you're advancing time again. So this would play probably the, well, it's going to play the default of the sine wave, um, the default sine wave frequency, which is 440, 440 hertz. And then um, it uh, is going to play something at 880 hertz. How does the um, Like lines two or five? Yeah, so basically, um, the line one is where you set up like a, um, a uh, it's a graph, it's a unit generator graph. So there could be a whole series of um, unit generators that are all routed to each other. So sine wave oscillator gets routed to say a reverb and then that gets routed to the DAC or chucked I should say. Um, and then once those things are all assigned, those unit generators are gonna be genera are going to generate sound as time advances. I'm, I'll actually. So it doesn't act on X specifically. It just you're, you're it, just saying it acts, acts on an entire graph. I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, so did we cover that? Yeah, basically we did. And I'm going to show an example in a moment. But this is kind of the background for the for the example. Um, I mean, I'm going to show a, a demo. So command line arguments. Um, this is where. Um, yeah. So you're going to you can invoke Chuck from the command line, and one strategy for using Chuck is to pass in command line arguments. Another strategy is to create templates and then um, invoke, you know, sort of run those templates through ERB or something like that and then um, uh, pass into Chuck. Um, in this example, um, we're passing in a command line argument. So we have our sine wave oscillator. Um, it's piped to the DAC. And then um, we are uh, grabbing the first argument of the, the com that's passed in on the command line and um, converting it from ASCII to an integer and chucking into a frequency, that's line four. And then um, line six, we're taking that um, frequency, which really should be called note, um, uh, and then uh, we're, we're passing that, um, value, we're converting that to an actual frequency, passing it to the sine wave, and then we're advancing time. So on the bottom is the actual um, <coughs> invocation that we make on the command line, so we chuck to um, uh, chuck arg pitch dot ck and then our argument 60. So that would be playing a, uh, playing a, a C note. And then this is an example of recording. Um, so all of these examples are, are inside the Snorkel project and I, I've chosen these specifically because they're the, the kind of examples that you'll, you'll probably want when you're trying to invoke Chuck from with within Ruby. So if this kind of breezes by, just look at the examples and, and, um, and you'll, you'll get the hang of it fairly quickly. Um, so in this uh, example, we have uh, on line four, um, after the DAC, we're piping out basically everything in our signal graph to 
wave out, um, stored in W, and then that is uh, then chucked to black hole. So it's kind of pulling the, the samples from the DAC through the, the uh, wave um, out unit generator to black hole. And this, this just trust me, you have to do that. And um, <laughs> the explanation for it is a little, little uh, it, it's, it's down the rabbit hole. Um, so line uh, seven, we're just naming the file. Then you advance time normally, and it records. So the two examples that I have at the bottom for um, invoking this on the command line, um, the first one is you'll actually hear the sound. And the second one, you pass in the dash S flag, which is for silent. And um, basically, it'll, it'll render it in non-real time, and you won't hear it. And it'll render it faster. So if, for instance, you were using Chuck on a server, and um, you wanted to uh, optimize the speed of that, um, you would pass in, pass in the dash S flag to Chuck, and it would do it twice. So um, all right, that's enough kind of talk um, about um, Chuck. I'm going to show you an example, which basically will take n values um, of pi and uh, convert them to notes and uh, play it with a little, bit of little sine wave, a little bit of reverb, and we'll record it silently, and then we'll play it back. So um, let's see, where am I? CD into, OK, so I wrote a uh, little wrapper. Um, you know what? First, I'm going to actually show you um, what I just was talking about, um, which is uh, playing a pitch. So here's that um, first example. We're just grabbing the command line argument and playing it as a pitch. <coughs> of pitch, passing 60. And <coughs> beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the second one is uh, simple record, but um, I'm going to skip that because we're going to be doing that in a moment anyway. Um, so inside of this other folder called otlottl, which is an otlottl is a thing you chuck a spear with. Um, it's a little wrapper for chuck that I wrote. And um, so we have this uh, simple as pi demo. Um, can everybody read that, or it needs to be bigger? It's about right? OK. OK. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll read you the comments. <laughs> I'll read you some of them. Um, OK. so. Here we have, um, we're creating this wrapper. Um, and uh, when, I, when this is called, it'll, it'll print out what it's actually calling to Chuck. We're setting the pitch offset, which is 60. So every, we're going to add 60 to every um, successive uh, um, numeral in our, our pi generation. Um, and then we're going to use 100 digits of pi and uh, have this implementation here. So then we're adding these events and uh, creates a big chuck string, you know, renders it. It's going to do it silently. Um, actually, maybe I'll just do it. Uh, I'll actually play it and generate the wave file here. And here's the result. So. So, so right here we have um, we have Chuck, and then it's uh, uh, it's then piping all these values to this simple render, um, and uh, these are all these command line arguments that are there. Not the most beautiful thing, but kind of proves proves the point and gets us through that. Like, oh, you know, I really want to use Pi and generate some music from it. There it is. It's kind of. Uh, Mildly disappointing, actually. <laughs> um, so let's see. Let's go back. We'll have a more exciting example in just a moment. <coughs> so um, ooh, I don't want to add a slide. Yikes. <laughs> I did. <laughs> All right. OK. So Bloopsophone. Uh, Bloopsophone is a project <coughs> written by Why the Lucky Stiff and Company. Um, it's a Ruby API for doing C chip tunes, um, and this is um, 
uh, it's basically written for doing um, game music and shoes. There's not a lot of documentation, but <clears throat> if you look at the examples, it's, it's pretty straightforward to use. Um, so I'm gonna do the sort of enhanced Pi demonstration where we use Pi and then we, um, we kind of quantize it a little bit and then we use this Euclidean rhythm generator, um, which is something sort of as a side note you might want to check out. Um, this, uh, there's this Euclidean rhythm generation al algorithm that basically evenly distributes a set of uh, uh, drum hits across um, a given number of beats, and it ends up creating patterns that are um, that are sort of clave-like. Um, they they sound like you know lots of um, sort of uh, polyrhythmic uh, patterns, and there was a, a claim when when the first paper came out on this that it was like generates it's like figures out like why we like certain rhythms, and I, I feel like it's sort of a specious argument, um, but it does create a lot of uh, of cool rhythms. So I'm going to use the Euclidean rhythm generator in this and demo it with Loopsophone, um, which is the C library for chip tunes, and uh, so let's take a look at that. So CD into Bloopsophone. So uh, let's start first with the Bloopsophone theme song, which is just, um, it's just the, the default demo. Um, basically, um, it's got, um, you do the, the definition of the, uh, uh, the instruments at the first part. Um, so this has a square wave, and you're, you know, you're setting up your punch, sustain, decay, um, all the sort of usual things you would expect um, when you're when you're defining an instrument, um, and uh, that's fairly defined. If you want to know what those are, I'm afraid you'll have to read the C code. Um, if you want to discover them, the easiest way to do it is just read the examples, um, and then it uses this kind of uh, Nokia-style um, notation for um, for pitches, um, and so this is the uh, aptly named Bloopsophone theme song. It sounds like this. <laughs> Okay, so um, we're going to do something else here, which is sort of a continuation of our example, um, <coughs> sort of exploring this generative music idea. So I've created four instruments here at the top, um, and then down here, um, I've created this just an array of notes, um, and there are um, ten values here. Um, and these are essentially what we're going to quantize the, the values of pi that we're getting. And then I've uh, created this simple little function here, um, which uh, is uh, called Greek melody, since this is like a Euclidean rhythm plus pi. It's, it has to be a Greek <laughs> melody. <laughs> um, so uh, I create this um, Euclidean rhythm here in line 55, and I grab these uh, uh, various numbers from pi, and what's kind of neat about this is it'll wrap the, the rhythm across whatever length of um, uh, the, the, however, what the um, number of significant uh, digits are of pi that we're using. Um, prints out the melody, and then down here, I kind of do it a few times, uh, so we have a three-section song ABA form, uh, and you can change the, the number of total beats here, and it scales. Um, so this is kind of like our first uh, sort of real generative music um, sounding thing. Um, and this, uh, so here it is. So uh, yeah, I really didn't premeditate a lot of the aesthetics of this. It, it kind of fell out of the Euclidean rhythms, which you could tell were kind of, they're, they're interesting kind of rhythmic, um, there's an interesting rhythmic output from that, so that's worth exploring. Um, okay, so back to this. Uh, so, all right, so that was kind of neat. We generated some music and it sounded okay. Um, and uh, I just kind of wanted to show you where the bar is in generative music these days. Um, 
So this fellow, David Cope, uh, teaches at the University of Santa Cruz. Um, he has a project called Experiments in Music Intelligence, which is a uh, Lisp application, which goes out and analyzes uh, scores from other composers. Um, and it creates uh, sort of like a Markov chain or uh, a kind of analysis of it that, that stores um, which pitches are played in combination with what, what they transition to, and which portion of the piece they are played in. Um, and uh, it, he then generates scores that are performed by musicians. So you always get some benefit if it's actually performed by live musicians. There's a lot of interpretation there. But um, this piece that I'm just going to play a sample from is um, from analyzing uh, a number of Beethoven pieces. And um, this is the output. So it starts out sounding like the Moonlight Sonata and then it kind of like diverges. sophisticated um, generated music. And <clears throat> he has some other um, scores that are full orchestral pieces, Bach chorales, other things. Uh, I, I don't know, I was just really struck by this whole thing. Actually, he, he um, <laughs> sort of a side note, he originally uh, had writer's block and wrote this program to solve the problem for him. And uh, <laughs> he then used this program to generate uh, compositions in his own style and then premiered the piece and the piece met more, uh, met better critical acclaim than anything that he had done previously. <laughs> and he was kind of like, he was kind of like, he didn't say anything about how he created the music for a while. So uh, he's, he's a pretty interesting character. And it's worth checking out some more of his music and also the, the algorithms that are used to make it. Okay, so um, on to another kind of generative music topic is uh, data sonification. So, um, I worked on this EEG data sonification project uh, with an artist named Sarah Philly, and um, we kind of asked this question of how do you get from a whole bunch of raw EEG data to uh, score? And we, we took a kind of raw approach, and I, I kind of want to show you this just because it's the kind of thing that as you get into generative music that you'll, you'll probably try. So um, the first approach was just kind of literal, like, we're going to take um, some numbers and we're going to map them directly to notes. And we're just, you know, what does this sound like? So this is what it sounds like. I think that's probably about as much of that as I can take. Um, and the second approach is like, all right, we're just going to eliminate, um, we're going to eliminate duplication of notes. So there's a little bit of rhythmicality that starts to emerge. And then next is like, okay, well now we're going to quantize it into some sort of major uh, or majorish kind of scale. Oops. Um, let's Slightly interesting. I mean, you you know, it's like you're willing to listen to it for longer than the first two examples, um, but it's still not like all that exciting. So um, the next kind of uh, iteration of this idea that um, that I tried was uh, working with the capacitor dance troupe. We were doing this kind of like geophysics themed multimedia performance, um, and um, we had access to some uh, raw geophysics data. And I, I had been studying um, harmonic theory with this fellow named Alaudi Matthew, and I thought, oh, why don't I take his harmonic theory, which is basically creating these lattices that are based on, um, uh, based on the overtone series, and um, run the, the data that I have through this lattice. And there's some other rules that I, that I used, um, but that's the, that's the general idea. And so the idea was to sonify this geological data, and this is the output. Um, <laughs> It's still a little bit floaty. So this is a picture of the data that we used, or was it this data? Um, I, 
I don't know, you can't really tell. So um, how does data map meaningfully to sound is kind of the question that I ended up with after this, and it's still kind of a hanging question that I, that I think about. Um, so meaningful data mappings, I'm just gonna mention a couple things. One is what, what can actually translate across domains, and there's this kind of idea of like meaning spaces, like something's meaningful in one domain and something's meaningful in another domain, how do you translate between those two things? And the other thing is uh, how can it be meaningful to the ear? So we, we have this kind of like raw series of data that, that could be played, you know, th th this kind of pie generation thing where the notes, like, they don't really hang together all that well. But you take the same thing and you, you know, you take pi and you create a sine wave and you get a perfect pure tone. And it's like, what, what mapping are you going to use that, that actually has some sort of meaning to the physiology of the ear? Um, and uh, so there's these two sort of questions, the, the aesthetic, meaningful to the ear, and is it meaningful and accurate to the data? Um, so I'm going to leave that <coughs> conversation there and uh, go on to um, our second profile, which is Henry Hacker. Um, so Henry wants a live code, and what's live coding, you may ask. So live coding is using your keyboard as an instrument, probably with a command line or a text buffer, um, and it can be soft or hard real time. Um, there's a website called toplab.org, um, and there's a manifesto draft that is up there. Um, so it is a manifesto in progress. Um, and it has some phrases such as code should be seen as well as heard, and live coding may be accompanied by an impressive display of manual dexterity and the glorification of the typing interface. So this is highly compatible with, uh, with Vim. Um, <laughs> um, anyway, so... Uh, Here's an application called Quoth that's written by uh, Craig Lotta, um, and uh, it's up at netjam.org slash quoth. It's an interactive fiction system in the spirit of Zork um, and other uh, tools such as that, uh, or games such as that. It's uh, executable natural language written in squeak small talk, and um, here's an actual demo of Craig using it. <laughs> um, so Craig, Craig says that he's going to open source that at some point, and we should encourage him to. Um, and uh, so the next question is uh, live coding in Ruby. Um, Herb is your friend. Um, that console had a lot of kind of Herb-like behavior. You saw him like step into objects and do things like that, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so um, I've written a little like starter project called Herbivore, which is um, it's up on GitHub, um, and it's a good live coding starting point. Um, allows you to send MIDI and spork some chuck shreds, which is like chuck language for creating uh, processes. Um, and it's uh, I think that the command line is a, kind of a nice tool for playing with uh, playing with audio, basically because there's there's two states of mind. <coughs> When you're, make, when you're doing music stuff, one is you're like, you're in the rhythm. You're actually in, in the sound of it. 
And the other is that you're thinking about being in the sound of it, or you're, you're thinking about the sort of compositional structure of things. And those are two really different mindsets. And if you're in the command line, you can get a little bit closer to that, um, to that being inside of the music um, state of mind. So um, I have this little text demo. Um, so OK, so we drop into Herb. I have Boson running in here, so you can kind of list your commands. Um, got this mediator key things and so what's kind of interesting about this is like all right this is making a bunch of kind of nasty sounds um, but the mapping is is important and you also can kind of use your keyboard uh, skills to actually play music and you can use phrases to remember sort of Like I would have a hard time remembering that melody. You can, you know, have strings of melodies that are uh, associated with text, and you can kind of use your your word grouping brain uh, functions for uh, for um, for actually remembering musical phrases, which is, is kind of a weird cross mapping. Um, so that's that demo, and you can play around with that. Um, let's see. Wow, ton more material here. Uh, so let's move on. So MIDI, uh, you probably know about that. Mediator is um, is uh, a cross-platform MIDI library um, that uh, Herbivore is using. It's written by Ben Blathing, and it borrows code from uh, Topher Sills pra uh, Practical Ruby projects. Um, gets used a lot. Um, also, Gamelon is a uh, scheduler by Jeremy Voorhis. Um, and I'd recommend checking that out. Um, so on to DJ Diana here, wants to control loops live. Um, so I'm gonna show you, so back to our herbivore thing. I was gonna kind of hook up Ableton Live and show you that, but it, it's, it's pretty easy to do, so I thought I'd just do something that's a little bit um, less like that. Um, and uh, incidentally, well, I'll, I'll talk about more. Okay, so um, but here we are back in the console, um, and Shred the keys. Now, you're noticing a little skip there. That's actually my fault and not Chuck's because I'm reading the files off the disk but it should be sorted out fairly quickly. So that's kind of the demo. I'm curious if... Uh So that's kind of an example of, oh. Cool, thanks. Um, yeah, so that, um, that, let's go back to our slides because I'm about to mention it. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll try to do it at the top of the screen. Um, so uh, Chucker is a wrapper around Chuck um, for, um, for creating Chuck processes. Um, or sporking chuck shreds, as it were. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> it's worth checking out. <coughs> um, it's also included up there in the Snorkel uh, library on GitHub. Um, so you can go check that out. Um, it's fun to poke around in there, different ways of adding in uh, various shreds and pulling them out, adjusting parameters. It kind of uses a template approach to create a class around a, um, a chuck patch and, uh, and then launch those as, as shreds. Um, so 
as I said, Ableton Live would uh, be pretty easy to do with Mediator and, uh, and Gamelon um, for passing MIDI um, to uh, Ableton and just triggering loops. Um, also, I should mention that um, there uh, is a JRuby object that um, Adam Murray has brought into the Max MSP um, program, uh, visual programming language um, that, it, that works quite well, and that's a, a great um, thing to do. Um, Adam is actually demoing the uh, demoing JRuby inside of Max tonight at the Barkman event, and um, there's Max for Ableton Live, and uh, there, what this means is that you can launch JRuby inside of Max inside of Ableton Live. So that's going to come out next week. Um, Adam just confirmed to me that it is possible. I think he's going to do a short demo of it tonight, um, and uh, that's you know if you're looking for the easiest way to get Ruby into your like live environment, I would. Uh, I, I mean, into your in live, literally live performance environment, I would definitely look at JRuby inside of Max for Live, um, unless you want to go down this more hackerish um, direction. So controllerism uh, is kind of a movement that's happening right now. I just wanted to mention it um, as sort of an inspirational point. Um, people building custom controllers and developing virtuosity with them, sort of more of a, a hardware endeavor. And I kind of wanted to share with you a little bit of what's going on in that space. So. This right here is uh, a fellow Edison has built um, this monome, which is a 64-button controller inside of a yellow lunchbox that he has purloined from his ex-girlfriend. And <laughs> on the right is um, is another controller that's made out of like arcade buttons. And uh, this is him performing on it, um, and he's developed some serious skills. <laughs> actually triggers the chords on it, which is like, dude, that's so awesome. <laughs> anyway, I saw, I saw him perform recently, and it, it was even more impressive than that. That was a cool demo, but the stuff he was doing, I was like, that is so awesome. He spent so much time with his instrument. So there's a lot of benefit of spending a lot of time developing an electronic music instrument, performing with it, and going back and refining it, and, and I would suggest going in that direction rather than perpetually spawning new little projects, which is my approach. Um, so um, other libraries and quick demos. I've given a certain amount of love to uh, Chuck, and I should give a lot of love to Super Collider because it's a really amazing uh, language. It has you know things like list comprehensions and currying, and it's fantastic, client-server model, um, <coughs> and uh, it's, it, it's really good. So um, I'm just going to do a really quick, um, there's a, a library called Scrooby. Uh, which is a super collider library. Um, and uh, let's see, where is it? There it is. Um, so this is Scrooby. And uh, this right here looks a lot like uh, super collider. You're booting the server, here's a synth definition. And then uh, just for fun, I kind of like am scheduling this Super Collider stuff inside of Gamelon, um, which is uh, Jeremy Voorhees' scheduler. And um, I think in order for this to play, I have to launch Super Collider over here uh, and turn on the server. You can do this all command line, but it's more difficult to compile. So let's see what happens here. Hopefully it'll work. So that's kind of cool. I mean, we just actually defined this FM synthesizer from within Ruby. Um, and here, you know, here's the envelope generator, sine wave oscillator. We're multiplying them together, doing FM synthesis stuff. And then I just scheduled it with uh, the Gamelon scheduler, which is like kind of insane because the super collider scheduler will be a lot more accurate. Um, but it's really neat that, that you can go back and forth between um, uh, between Ruby and Super Collider like this. So I just wanted to give a quick demo of that. 
And um, one last thing is this Lily Pond score writing um, thing. I know you guys can't really, maybe you can't see this down here. Um, and um, there, is, is it Lily Pond or Lily Pal? Lily Pond. So um, I just wanted to kind of quickly show you that um, it's possible to generate um, scores um, from within Ruby. Um, and uh, so this just, you know, this is kind of a template thing, and I just generated some notes there. Um, this thing here, uh, that bit is actually the um, the score language for Lily Pond, and I've just kind of recreated a wrapper around it. So it wouldn't have been so hard to kind of convert between our like weird Bloopsophone Euclidean Pi thing and and generate a score for it so that I could have my orchestra play along with it. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. Um, so anyway, that's there, and that's that's pretty useful. You can generate PNG files. You can generate PDFs with uh, Lily Pond. Pretty exciting stuff. Um, other useful libs. Um, MIDI lib is a classic. You can generate MIDI with it. Um, written by Jim Maynard. Uh, that's sort of a standard. It's been around for a while. And uh, I decided not to demo this, but um, Opaz Plug DK is this like um, declarative uh, VST plugin generator uh, written in Ruby for generating JVST wrapper uh, VST plugins. It's worth checking out. There's a blog post. Um, it's kind of mad. I've used it. It actually works um, and kind of exciting. So interesting projects in that direction. So here's some areas for development. Scheduler improvement, synchronization. There might be some, you know, like what what is the best uh, and, and most accurate scheduler that we can build in Ruby, and you know, part of that is dependent on kind of language level developments. Um, composition libraries and DSLs um, that we can kind of share. Um, improved super collider and chuck libraries. Um, those are kind of rudimentary right now, and you, there's no documentation. You kind of have to dig around, and it's, it's exciting, but it's not like super usable. Um, so improving those would be great. Um, Unit generator signal graphs. Once again, Jeremy Voorhis has, um, you know, uh, has written a, a library for wrapping um, uh, core audio um, uh, unit generators, um, which I played around with. It's it's pretty cool and it's something to watch. Um, that's that's an area to explore. Um, and you also, if you want to play around with snorkel and herbivore, which I posted, you know, please send me patches and or or don't and just uh, play with that. Um, so that's the end. Um, So right now, they're um, right, like right now, it's strangely timed. Uh, at 7 p.m. Um, in the city at Embarcadero and Townsend, um, there is a Barkma meetup. Um, Tom Lieber is going to present. He's been doing some like really low-level like direct calling of Chuck within Ruby. Um, Adam Murray is going to present on um, Max MSP running JRuby inside of it and JRuby inside of Max MSP inside of Live. And then um, also uh, uh, J.D. Northrup is going to present. Um, he's from uh, from Pixar, and he's going to present uh, some one of his side projects, which is um, uh, controlling processing and reactor with Ruby. Um, and there's going to be a few other presenters as well. Um, and so if you want to come out, tonight would be a good night. And if you live in the Bay Area or you're coming by, just check for events because we do a lot of stuff. Um, so finally, the examples that I showed are all up um, on GitHub mostly in, uh, in that snorkel project, github.com slash slash snorkel, and my blog's there, and thank you very much. Um, any questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so unit generator... Um, a uh, unit generator would be like a sine wave or a square wave or um, some other, uh, like a delay. Um, the, um, the typical way that audio um, programming languages work is that they define a graph of unit generators. So you say, you know, pipe my sine wave oscillator to this reverb, and then after that I want to apply this, like, you know, whatever Chebyshev polynomial, uh, you know, like, uh, process to it or something like that. And so it's it's like, it's basically a series of, um, uh, uh, it's, it's a graph, essentially, of graphing the output of one unit generator to another. Is that, uh, is that like the same thing as the audio unit framework on MacOS X, or is that 
Um, uh, you could consider one audio unit to be a single unit generator, and then you would your uh, the output of that going into another unit generator would be the signal graph. So, so in essence, yes. Um, and uh, yeah, J Jeremy Voorhis's project definitely touches on that. And um, yeah, the J. Um, uh, yeah, the VST wrapper um, thing is also in that direction. Um, and uh, yeah, any other questions? Ooh. All right, thank you all very much.